a scion of many worlds. The fallout had been, it had been horrific. Everyone had wanted a piece of the heads, especially once he got the audio diary playing. It had revelations for the population. It had revelations for him. The Luxway was not the only group on the planet with advanced technology in reserve somewhere, but in this part of the continent, they were the major players. There were at least four more on the world with the Grand Midwives counting as one. This meant three more known parties that had their heads up their asses and an unfair advantage over the rest of the population. Most interesting had been a series of specific audio logs, all in the voices of the women in question and several missing parties, presumably the girls undergoing a regenerative coma at the time. It was a self-introduction and an explanation of their goals and ideals. Those had gone over about as well as a farmer catching a fox in his hen house. End results. Mass executions. They had all been given an even sweep of elemental death. One was given to him, and he had been merciful by slicing their head in half with a blurring fast swing of his claws. He didn't even have gore on him, a relief as someone being force-fed a fireball or so much water that their stomach cavity burst was horrific. One was slowly crushed under stones. A dark aromenta had reached in and simply removed a heart. The wind girls had an idea born of the water girls, or perhaps it was the other way, where they force-fed an obscene amount of air to shred the lungs of the one they got. These girls were nasty when pissed. The worst of it was there was no way he could stop it without completely destroying his own position and power. But he was able to argue that the underlings were innocent rubes these witches had used, a revolution but one that was almost entirely bloodless. Twelve deaths, including the council he had massacred, which meant technically he had killed seven of the twelve. It both did and didn't bother him, mostly in how much it didn't bother him. The old banners and flag were having the symbol of the undaunted painted onto them. Everything had come together, but it revealed just how much more work there was to do. There was at least another piece of technology in the nearby Bright Dawn archipelago and its pirate-slash-not-pirate bullshit. The Greenstone Alliance still has infiltrators and the Goldlands needs those rivers undammed and their feathers unruffled and that's if, big if, they don't have their own special brand of infiltration. Then comes the other half of this one continent. The northern mountains were thankfully a job already done if Magrika's to be believed. They were too focused on living their best lives to have conspiracies, and they lived there because it was a place away from everyone's drama and stupidity that had a lot of game, a lot of resources, and a lot of room for their young ones to grow up and their elderly to retire to. There was a loose collection of city-states with a patrolling army that refused to call itself a proper nation, despite having all the components of an actual nation, up to and including currency and a unified justice system, moral values, and even accent. That one's going to be annoying. Either the people have their heads up their asses and are deliberately ignoring the definition of a nation, or are being kept disunified and snobby by someone else. Next to it was a series of two major archipelago chains that allowed fairly easy crossing over the ocean to the next continent over which he had little, if any, information about. But the archipelagos were where the majority of the Jorgua were located. Apparently, the crocodilian species liked swimming over the entire freaking ocean. Who could have guessed? Beyond that, there was apparently a major slaver empire, a large roving horde of marauders that Lady Aylur is very ashamed to be descended from, a pair of empires with rigid caste systems that are both declaring themselves the grand rulers above all, and at this rate, a partridge in a pear tree. Somewhere in the midst of all this mess, was Morgana Skidderway observing everything and tapping all the advanced communication networks that the conspiracies use to keep things going, in addition to whatever else she's got in her web, such as the satellites high above that are literally watching the world. 
couple that with some strategically placed drones or basic droids with listening devices and you've got a nigh-perfect observation network. Especially if the satellites can see through walls, things were moving along much more smoothly now. According to the heads of the Star Seekers, some of the information that they'd been getting out of the radio was enough to seriously accelerate their next harvest and they were soon to have another bumper crop. So that's a possible logistical nightmare solved, but he still had a fair amount of his army out and hunting in order to bring in extra food. Apparently those, without moderately to very high positions of power, were missing meals due to the drought in the Goldlands. That was a mess to take care of yesterday. He needed to get the lifelines of the nation back up and running, which meant diplomacy, which also means somehow convincing them that, yes, he has conquered Miru, but that also means convincing the armies he's in charge and getting them back from provoking the nearby kingdoms. There's a lot to do. First things first, end the chaos in the capital and get his hands on all the visual expressions of Miru authority he can. After that, he can use them to do something about the armies and possibly the neighboring nations as well. He really doesn't want to leave a series of dead bodies wherever he goes. But first, quell the chaos. His army is in the city and in the process of mounting their cannons at strategically advantageous positions, as well as reuniting with family when they have a few moments to breathe after all the work. Then there was the question of the former empress. Apparently she had been privy to the broadcasted audio diaries and was now refusing to leave her bed. She had nothing left. Her mother has been dead for years. The Luxway had been her family, and ruling the empire of Miru had been her whole purpose in life. At this rate she would do something stupid just to get killed alongside the pillars of her worldview. Perhaps that would be a good place to start? Show the city that there's a more civilized approach to a shift in power. They had their blood. Now it was time to build a new and repair what had been broken. Then, after that, he had to see to the ship. That one was going to be something else. It was a downright archaeological treasure and it was being used. Not that he could complain as he still has the communicator on him. He had changed the password, though. Excuse me. He says to the guards in front of the former empress's chamber, time to get things moving and if she can't rule an empire, then being a symbol of its rebirth may help. Who knows? She may be a better idol than ruler. Either way, he needs to do something before a dark whisper of a child taking her own life in despair becomes a thing. He unclasps his weapon belt and lays the swords to the side then vanishes into the girl's chambers. He's greeted by a scream and a pillow flying to his face. It impacts and then drops into his waiting hand. I don't think you should be throwing a down pillow around. You're a monster, she screams. Is that a physical observation, an emotional reaction, or teenage angst? He asks flatly. The door opens behind him as he talks as the guards start watching. Clearly they don't trust him with her, which is reasonable. He's a grown-ass man that just entered the room of a child. Not that they have much concept for the other reasons why this is suspicious as hell. Everything was fine until you showed up. Okay, so it's either emotional or teenage, which, to be honest, is pretty much the same shit in two piles. For whom? For you. Deceived and manipulated your whole life? Perhaps your counsel, whom were also dancing to unknown strings and slowly ripping the world around you apart? Certainly not for the people, betrayed and abused by routine. It wasn't even all that good for your malefactors. Their idiot obsession with the least stable forms of power possible led them to their own ruin and lives full of paranoia and distrust where their own beds and meals are suspect. He rants and she looks shocked. How is any of that fine? How is being lied to and controlled by people who don't care about you okay? At what concentration of power is it a fair trade-off for a life full of paranoia and pain? This system was horrible. It just had a thin gilding on it to make it look acceptable. He catches another pillow to the face. 
You know you're going to need something heavier if you're planning on actually hurting me. You're immune to light, you monster. Nothing should be immune to light, she protests. According to whom? The women that manipulated and controlled you your whole life? The women that deliberately kept others ignorant and weak for their own benefit? Those women? He demands. And this time outright dodges as he does not want her chamber pot anywhere near him. Okay, that's it. He tosses the pillows onto the bed and stomps forward even as she scurries away in fear. Then he abruptly teleports beside her and grabs her, prompting laser beams to try and start boring into him. He lets her do it for a few moments. Then he gives her a shake and starts addling the local axiom out of its natural setting, agitating it to move in certain ways that have nothing to do with light. He puts her down in a chair and points a claw in her face. You are going to sit there, and you are going to listen, or by God I will spank you again, child. She gazes up at him sulkily. I understand that you are confused and frightened. That's fine. That's understandable. I'd be shocked if you weren't. But there are limits and lines not to be crossed. Nod if you understand. She nods. Good. I'm going to be sending you to Aridus Valley to learn under the scholars of the Order of the Star Seekers. You have spent most of your life in training for your role. Going back into the role of a student should feel like putting on a properly broken pair of boots more than anything else. They're savages. Barring those without technology and secrets left over from the Age of Miracles, they're the most learned and wise people I have met upon this world. Furthermore, they're in steady contact with my people, the Undaunted. This is just an invasion, isn't it? A huge farce to destabilize my nation and people before you roll your real army in. Monster! No, I'm the first of a rescue operation. My people come with the intent of healing and teaching, not destruction. Pretty words from a monster that murdered my council. She spits at him. Righteous indignation from the brat who hated them all. He spits back. He then takes a deep breath and stand up fully while running a claw over his head to think. Fighting her isn't going to help. She's a petulant little brat hat, was never told no, and never had even the concept of a daddy to keep her on the straight, and his mind starts churning and he smiles. Yes, that would work. What would work? She asks, having picked up on his tone and is suddenly nervous. I've been speaking of mercy and restraint, and I'd like to think I've led a wonderful example. However, there is more I can do. I'm going to make you my personal project, he says with a grin. What? She demands, and he nods. You need direction. I need to show people that I'm more than just a killing machine aimed at acceptable targets. So I'm going to adopt you. You will be my daughter and I will break your wretched habits, shatter your delusions, and mold you into a proper and decent person. I'll need to speak with Admiral Cistern to ensure that he can have the paperwork ready. You are not my mother, nor shall you ever be. Of course not. I'm a male. I'd be your father, he remarks. Traditionally on earth, fathers are more disciplinarians than nurturers, something you desperately need. I'm plenty disciplined. You can't just suddenly declare yourself my parent and expect that to work. Why not? I walked into armies and declared myself the leader. I walked into the throne room and declared myself ruler. It seems to work around here. He notes with a chuckle. I am not your child. To bad. Soon enough you legally will be. He then ruffles her hair and she starts clawing at his arm in return. Adorable. Now to the first order of business. What's your name? What? Your name was never mentioned in any of the audio logs and everyone always refers to you as Queen or Empress. Either way, it's annoying me and I need your proper name before I adopt you. Or I'll name you myself and I'll be naming you after both of my mothers. What? Yeah, you don't look like a Shandice Morgana. Maybe a Morgana Shandice? He muses, scratching his chin in thought. How do you not know my name? She screeches at him. No one's used it. He protests and she screams in frustration. This was clearly off to a roaring start. Literally.